Uh, and then I remember there was great excitement in the office when we got telex machines that had memory. So you no longer had to use the feed to feed everything in. Uh, and uh, you, the, the telex were all of a sudden uh, there. You, 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 could re- you could edit them much quicker than you, you'd have to do in the past. So we were saving hours per day in terms of this type. So, so this was usually transformative. And everybody thought, you know, these are type of eureka moments. It, it doesn't really get any better than this. That is the voice of Glenn Murphy, a shipbroker with over 30 years of experience as a broker and the current chair of the Institute for Charter Shipbrokers. Glenn and I talk about the evolution of shipbroking in the digital age, why brokers will be around for a long time, and how the smart ones will use technology as part of their value-added service to their clients. I hope you enjoyed this episode as it was near and dear to my heart. Don't forget to follow the podcast and leave a five-star review. Now on to the show. Welcome, everyone, and you are listening to The Last Dinosaur, and I'm your host, Chris Aversano. On today's podcast, we have Glenn Murphy, Managing Director of Irish Shipbrokers and Charter Chartering LTD, as well as Chairman of the Board, Institute of Charter Shipbrokers. In today's podcast, we're going to talk about the evolution of shipbroking with a focus on the digital age. This is a topic, uh, if many of you have listened to the podcast, uh, you know, is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I've spent 13 years 13 plus years of being a ship broker in a few different capacities uh, and now working as a product manager for Vesson. We have a SaaS product that focuses on brokers as a client. Glenn, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Chris. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And looking forward to this conversation. So let's let's set the table for all of our uh, you know audience listeners, those that are unfamiliar with with uh, ship broking. Talk to us about what is the day in the life of a ship broker today. I know that you, you've you've worn these shoes. You've uh, you've been a ship broker yourself, and I th- I think we we all use the cliche in this business. And I've actually heard some of your, your previous guests talk about that. No two days in this business are ever the same, and it, it really is. Uh, you know the truth. I think it what it's what keeps us on our toes most of the time is is the unexpected and what's unforeseen. Um, in terms of trying to plan a typical day for me, I, I typically sit down on Sundays and uh, look at my week ahead. You know, when I look there, you 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 know that there's a certain number of meetings that you'll have. I typically keep my meetings in the afternoon because the mornings are generally rush hour. As you know, we've got um, the client calls. We'll be in the market. We've got vessels reporting in, and so you typically you typically keep that time. So to try and set out where your week is on Sunday and look at it over the course of the week is always the ideal plan. But as we know that in this business, it's the unforeseen that we it's the things that we haven't planned that typically will throw your week up, and it generally ha- it happens more often than we'd like. But it's really where brokers earn their money. I mean, the execution side of the business, agreeing a price, great, vessels done, vessels fixed. It's the easy part, and I think anybody can do that. But really where we earn our money is um, when problems arise. And we only have to look now, you know, like it's, we look at where we are with Russia. It's a major event that happened. There was always a potential that they may do something like this. They did it in 2014. They went into Crimea. But the going into Ukraine, people didn't think it would happen, but it happened. And all of a sudden, we were dealing with a whole different reality that massively impacted our business. And we had to think on our toes, what were the counterparty risks, what exposures we had to Russia at that time, where our vessels were, where our clients, if we had Russian clients, how they would be impacted by this. So that was you know one set of events that happened more or less overnight and our world's changed. And having that on top of just come out of covid where it was again a pandemic and it literally we we had just finished um, vessels in Korea and it was the most problematic place for us where we had vessels during COVID and the Korean government announced that they were reducing or relaxing their quarantine sanctions on vessels and we all said hallelujah it was our biggest bugbear we'd had be- vessels there for 20, 30, 40 days delayed so we actually felt a little bit relaxed the next morning we woke up and the headline was Russia invades Ukraine and all of a sudden, we were back into it again. So we know that these things, in terms of day to day, and they then dictate where things slow. But typically, we can have uh, weather related issues, we can be dealing with currency issues, uh, currency defaults. Uh, we have we can have ships grounding ships in collisions, we can have unfortunately incidents aboard ships where people are injured or killed, which impacts uh, immediately, it's a very can be a very serious matter. We've got cargo damages, 
ships arrested and um you know i, I started a the morning there uh, a year or so ago where i had to call at half five from a second officer on board a vessel in the gulf of guinea who had just been pirated so we do a lot of business into west africa and uh, piracy was it has it's still there now but it's the incidents are, are less less frequent but you know these are the things that you don't expect you don't plan for but you have to be able to respond and it's your experience and your time as a broker uh, over the years and learning from your mentors and being through similar situations that enables you to to be calm and to be able to take the client through it and if i look at covid for example which was a major major disruptor for not just for our business but for for the, for everybody everybody had to deal with different realities of what covid was even though it was um usually disruptive, we, we had been through uh, something similar in 2017, 2018 with Ebola in the Congo. So we were dealing with vessels that were calling there, hugely infected disease, killed a lot of people. It was tended to be um, constrained within that area or contained within, within the area. But we typically had to then deal with vessels in quarantine. We had to come up with new clauses, infectious diseases clauses that we put into charter parties. There were procedures where vessels couldn't call to this port or they couldn't call to other ports subsequently. So we had a template immediately when the COVID pandemic came along where we were able to say, well, look, we've been through this. This is what we did in these areas. These were the quarantine rules we had. So again, it was some experience. So we can't be prepared for everything, but over your life cycle, over time, it's those experiences as a broker, not just the agreeing the price and fixing the ship. It's all the other things in between that really bring the value. And that's really where you you, you are uh, pitted uh, to to earn your crust and to be able to provide that confidence to the counterparties or to your principals on the other side. I don't know about anybody else who's listening, but I can tell you that I had a little bit of a flashback there for all the things that you were mentioning, you know, uh, basically all those things. I recall that happening. I was not a broker during COVID, but certainly during other uh, major events. I was actually on the chartering desk when 9-11 happened, uh, which was also kind of interesting, you know, a real uh, bellwether change that kind of put everything to a standstill. Uh, and actually, I recall somebody saying to me, a broker saying he had subs on a VLCC at a very competitive rate. The the subs expired during when everything was going down. He couldn't get a hold of the charter and just lifted subs anyway, and because otherwise the rate was would triple. Like it, it went it went crazy because of the unknown. So it's and I keep on asking myself that question every now and again. I'm like. What would I have? Would I have lifted subs? You know, because the chart owner wasn't granting anything, and it just go, it goes to show about like just the experience and everything else. And I think people do get fixated on well, you all you're doing is agreeing date, rate, and lay can, and yeah, a lot of voyages date, rate, and lay can, and you know, uh, date, rate, and um, and to merge, excuse me, and you move on with life. It's it's the extra stuff uh, that really gets you and that separates you. Um, with from a technology point of view over the course of, of your time, what has changed for you? Uh, uh, what has changed since you started? Or what is the major change in terms, especially in terms of technology um, since you started started uh, on the broken desk? Well, I know you, I know you love technology and uh, I know it's always a constant team through the shows and looking at the last 20 years, the, the, the advances and the changes in technology in the broken business have probably been more profound in terms of their impact of what we do day to day uh, than it was in the previous 30, 40, 50 years before that. Um, I know it's a, it is something that we see in terms of the the AIS data that's there now in terms of track and tracing ability that we have, but also the uh, rich content of information. I mean, the amount of information that we can get now at the click of a button uh, once we know where to subscribe to it or to amass it from it is, is is a multiple of what it was in the past. Uh, and the time that we can spend on things like that uh, compared to what we would have had to do manually in the past is, 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 is the landscape has completely changed in that regard. And it adds value to what we do. It improves us. It makes us more efficient. Uh, it enables us to be able to uh, reproduce or to provide that information, to distill it, to provide it to our clients in a different way. So technology has been an absolute enabler. Uh, I remember when I, I started in the business as, as a trainee, 
uh, we were working with telexes. And I think if you ask most uh, people, entries, the entrants that are, are understudies that are working in the business, and they wouldn't know what a telex was. Uh, and one of my first jobs was making sure that there was ribbons to go into the, the telex machines and to make sure that when I went home in the evening that there was telex paper in all the machines because they didn't have the ability to record. So it was the printed version that came out in the telex w- was so important. Uh, and then I remember there was great excitement in the office when we got telex machines that had memory. So you no longer had to use the feed to feed everything in. Uh, and uh, you, the, the telex were all of a sudden uh, there. You, 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 could re- you could edit them much quicker than you, you'd have to do in the past. So we were saving hours per day in terms of this type of stuff. So this was usually transformative and everybody thought, you know, these are type of eureka moments. It, it doesn't really get any better than this. You know, little did we know where we are now. And, you know, I often used to say to people, um, you, I wonder going back to the 15 and 1600s, did the people get excited or did they get worried about when they invented postage stamps or when they went from, you know, ink quills to, to burrows and burrows to typewriters? Were they the same type of excitements or were they the same type of fears that people had back then? Who knows? But certainly in terms of impacts, they're the type of things in terms of digitalization that, that we've seen through through our, our business in terms of how it makes us better at what we do, it, it definitely adds more value to to what to the role of the broker than than uh, it would have done. And I think, as you've said at the start, if you if a broker is just trying to survive on price, the Murridge and Lake can you know the, the days of that broker are, are long gone. If that is you know you, you don't survive as a broker, if all you can be is is, is, a, is a simple fixing point because people expect more value. Uh, and I think the level of professionalism in brokers uh, in the in the main in the bigger brokerage houses has definitely risen in terms of the quality and caliber of, of the services that the companies provide. And it's a rising tide. So every other broker that's there, you either keep up and you up your game. Even if you're working in a niche market, you need to be able to to replicate that and to be as good as these guys. So the standards in the industry technology has certainly been a major, major driver for that. You know, it, that's absolutely right. And and it, it does come down. There is a relationship thing and, and there's still a, obviously a huge part of that, you know, relationship. You want to feel comfortable with the person on the other side of the phone uh, and that person has your, you know, your back. Um, one of the things, and I remember this kind of came to light in the early 2000s when we had the first tech boom, but, but now really starting to come into focus. Uh, and that is, and I think you talk a little bit, you kind of hinted around it a little bit with your analogy about, you know, quill pens to, to typewriters to so on and so forth. Um, and, and that is, you know, ship brokers, I think have an inherent fear, fear that they'll always be replaced. And I think some of that is generated by a lot of the deals that are done directly between the two principles. Um, and I think sometimes it's exasperated by technology. We're going to be replaced by technology. We're going to be be replaced. But it sounds like, and I think you and I are on the same mindset that it's not a replacement, it's an additive, uh, you know, kind of, h- how do you feel about that? I mean, I, th- I, th- I think it sounds like that that's what you feel as well, that the technology is not really there to replace it because there is a an element of relationship. Plus, I think there's a few other things which we can explore, but certainly the the main one is the relationship, but then it's an additive uh, to the value to the value that brokers bring. What's kind of your thinking on that? Yeah, no, it, it's something that you, you you hear regularly, and I don't think it's unique to this business to to our industry. Every industry probably has some fears that technology is going to replace them. And before it used to just be the concern about robots and uh, computers. Uh, now we've got artificial intelligence, which is taking it to a whole new level in terms of where the industry may be in the future. I think when, when you, you strip it back, you've got to look at the fundamentals of what this business is about. And essentially, while there is an element of on-screen trading and there is an element of hit a button and, and take a price, I don't think you can replace the human element. And it's, a, it's a trade. It's a profession that's been around for hundreds of years. And it is that piece of being the intermediary in the middle uh, and having that skill uh, to be able to work between two counterparties and to bring them together. And quite often what we're, who we're dealing with is very two large personalities on either side, whether it's a ship broker or a charterer, and neither of them typically want to lose face. And they can find at times where you've got two very large objects, they can grade on each other, uh, and somebody comes out the loser in that equation. And uh, neither side likes it, and it can over time probably create a little bit of hostility 
and you know the tension can be there our job is typically sitting in the middle of that and being the guys that break all that down uh, and uh, good brokers i think have the ability to make both parties feel at the end of a, a negotiation that they've both won uh, even though that may not be the case but if you can make both parties go away and feel like actually they've got a good deal and the price they've paid is fair or the price they've paid is realistic but the, you know you, you can add more value to that nobody feels like they're losing so i think that's a fundamental role that we sit in the middle that robots won't replace but it's also it's the added value conversations that you have when you bring both parties to lead them to that decision it's the extra piece that you can provide them with the market knowledge whether it's a, a geographic issue whether it's a geopolitical situation whether it's a rate whether it's a demand whether you're able to tell them about the forward curve what you're seeing in terms of congestion in an area why it's a good time to fix now or maybe not a good time to fix now all of these things you're not going to get on 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 a on a on a, um, from a computer it's not going to provide you with that now as we speak but long into the future in terms of what artificial intelligence will do it's certainly going to make us up our game it's certainly going to have to take us to a new dimension. But everything that I've seen in terms of technology has enabled, has added value to what we do. I remember, again, going back to the very early part of my career, uh, one of my mentors saying to me, don't be a post box. If you simply just depend on sending the, the mail as you've got it across to the other side, you're dead if you're not any, adding any value. So, you know, we've, I've carried that and that's, you know, it, it sat with me straight away. We, we're not postmen. We're here to, to deliver a message. But our job actually is looking at that content before we send it on. What are the added value can we tell our principals on either side? Not just the printed message that's there. What can we tell them that's additional to that? What we can see in that message that maybe is preparing them for something else that's coming down the line. That is where the human element, that is where we're able to use all the other soft skills and life skills that we have to break down the message and not purely just hit the button and, and forward it on. The days of doing that, again, if you if that's the space you're in, you're finished. I was listening as well to, um, I think it was, might have been the last podcast, um, Michelle from Lloyd's List was was on. And I felt it was, it was a, a very good, really interesting, fascinating uh, work that they're doing. Uh, and what she was explaining around... Uh, tracking the dark fleet using AIS and all the other technologies and uh, tricks that they have to do that. And it was it was quite strange to me because with Lloyd's List, one of the first jobs that I had going back was taking the printed copy of Lloyd's List as a trainee. I was tasked to go and go through vessels positions anywhere in the world. And I was there to look for nuggets, look for ships that were moving from place to place. So this is a long time before AIS and even the telexes that the ship owners gave us. Back in those days, can you imagine that ship owners used to send their circulars in the post and you would sit and wait for the stamp and see a German stamp and you'd be excited. Here's some <laughs> ship coming in so that we were going to, you know, it, it was gold. But my job was to look for those things and to try and look forward and where that ship is going to be in 20, 30 days' time that nobody else had the information for. And we could go through hundreds of, hundreds of those positions, but there may be one nugget in that that enabled us to put that ship in front of a client ahead of the other brokers that we may be competing on that account for. And that was that that was the use of Lloyd's List then. And here we have Lloyd's List today using AIS technologies to to provide different content to their clients in a different way. So you know the, the, sometimes things can go can go full circle in that regard. You know, it's really funny because that was a really interesting podcast. I enjoyed uh, speaking to Michelle and she did give, you know, a lot of uh, her insight. Um, you know, I, I think it comes back to the additive value proposition that any middleman, whether it's a ship broker, real estate agent, whatever, ha can give to their client. And, you know, I just think, I, and I think you you also touched upon it a little bit, but I want to expand. I think that it, it Yes, it's the it's the you know prefixture and and kind of the prefixture and and when to strike, when not to strike, and all this other all these other things that go around it. But I think one of the biggest added values, and it's a little missed, you know, is the post fixture operations and and not just you know okay the ship's on time, but really having that experience 
uh, in the post fixture space to help. Because one of the things, and, and if I got this wrong, I apologize, but I think one of the things that came out of COVID was that Exxon, I worked for Exxon Mobil. Well, I worked for Mobil, and then we were purchased by Exxon. For the first time, I think in their history, formally laid off people. I, I think I'm right on that back right after COVID when, when profits were low and all this other stuff. And so you think about them, right? And think about operators that it may have they may have had around. And I'm kind of guessing a little bit that this happened, but it is it happened. Any big companies, you lay off me or senior people retire, they don't replace them with equally senior, you replace them with junior people. And all of a sudden you have a vacuum of, you know, that particular trade lane, that particular cargo type, that particular port, or what have you, or the vessels that service that trade. Where does that get filled in? That gets filled in by the broker, right? Because the broker is gonna know. Yeah, I know it says in your voyage orders you have to give notice 48 hours, but you're going to this point, I do it 72 ahead because they tend to lose things, you know. So like just those and I, I'm not accusing any ports of be, of nefarious nature, but you just know, oh, that's the operator at that terminal. Yeah, you better pick up the phone and call them cuz sometimes they don't read their emails. It's those little things. Those little little things that I think that and ex- that the experience of, of that's required by a principal, an owner or a charter, sometimes, you know, and they're looking to cut costs depending on what the market's doing, can be picked up by the broker as an additive, as the added value. Well, I can add value there because I know that port because we've sent you know, we send a dozen ships or three dozen ships a year to that port. I know everything there. And I think that that's the added value. In addition to other things that technology can bring, how do brokers, uh, how do they use technology to, uh, let's say uh, right now, sanctions, right? You know, how do we go, hey, listen, I, I know that this ship maybe shows up good on your sanction, but we were looking at it for somebody else and they waved a red, red flag. You may want to relook at that. So the, there's all these little things that you could do to to just give them that additive support. And I think that that's missed. And I think that technology can help. And I think it's going to say, like you said, as the bigger shops who have more horsepower behind them, it's going to cause everybody. It's, you know, high tide raises all boats. And I agree 100%. I don't think it's going to replace people. You may see consolidation in shops, but I can't see it at any time because I also think the final piece is I think that uh, that the principals, especially on the oil side, especially on the oil company side, they want a middleman there in case something happens. They could not necessarily blame them, but look for some cover. Uh, and I think that that's a hugely important part of the role that maybe it's a little bit of unsaid, but if something goes wrong and you do it direct, you can't run anywhere. Yeah, no, I, I you know fully agree with everything you said, and it, it's it's how we see how I see things day to day, and uh, the days of the broker just purely fixing the ship and then walking away. That's finished. I mean, we're all all now full brokerage operations. We we advise pre fixture the analytics on the market, what what they were seeing in terms of shaping the deal that's fixed, and then we take over the voyage. I mean, we are day to day on every single element of the voyage right through to post fixture. So we're fully immersed in the voyage from A to B. And as you said, even little nuggets where you're looking at a ship on a route to a port and you know from the other data that you've got by getting the ship to increase its speed by two knots, it's going to a- arrive ahead of three or four other vessels that we know that are heading to the same place. And if they don't, they're going to sit behind four ships. You know, it's those small, as you say, all of the data that you have, you just hope your competitors aren't aren't watching the same things as you are. But if you can add that, I think it will it will gain you. Uh, maybe the next charter uh, might get you thanks for five minutes. But look, it is what it is. It's uh, you you have to be as good. You've got to be. Um, one of my favorite musicians is, is a guy called um, musician called David Gray, and he had an album recently uh, called Golden a Brass Age. And that's what we need to be as brokers. We we need to be the gold in the brass age. We need to be constantly ahead and to be one step. And the last thing you want to be is brass in a gold age because you're done for. So it is, you know, it's what keeps us on our toes. It's what keeps us fresh. And it's it's the competitive nature of this business that it is it is the survival of the fittest. And it's uh, it's why there's a lot of really, really good people doing this because they're, they're very good at it. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, and I, I've heard this as many, many times, you're only good as your last fixture, right? So, you know, and, and it, it, that that's something that, you know, switching into, into the IT world or, the, you know, I look at that and everybody's, hey, we did this great. And I'm like, all right, move on. They're like, well, 
okay, uh, gee, uh, you know, and, and that's just, and I have to back off of that a little bit because my, that's how my mindset is, right. It, 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 it comes into that sort of thing. And, and, and it, it has, you know, applications, but you, you know, as you kind of, as I've personally kind of gone into a slightly different role, although still, you know, tangential to the brokers, it's, uh, it's important. Uh, one of the other things that we, that, that I mentioned is you, you are the, uh, the, the chairman of, of ICS. Can you talk a little bit about kind of what that does and why that's important uh, in the world of, of, of shipbroking? And, and I've seen a lot of people be super proud of when they get their, cert- when they pass their test. And I see it on LinkedIn a lot. And, and I know people, there's a few people who aren't in shipping, well, who are in shipping, but not broking, um, who got it and who were just super excited to get it anyway. It's like a, a feather in their cap. Uh, talk a little bit about what, what, what you guys do there. Well, we're, we're, um, yeah, I mean, I, I can relate to that. having been through, through, uh, as a student myself, um, the, the sheer joy when you pass these exams, because they're hard earned. They're, they're not easy exams. And anyone that's been through them will, will recognize the, the pain and the, the, the lost sleep and the nights shifts you've got to put in to get the study, to get yourself over the line. So I can understand the euphoria when people come through because it, it is a it is a fairly joyous moment and it's uh, it's always great to see new students coming through. And we've got lots of students around the world now um who've just finished their exams and are relaxing uh, over the summer so and waiting on their uh, exam results to come out next month. So um, yeah, the institute itself is a is a professional body, and we've been around for over 110 years. Uh, we're a royal charter body as well, and that gives us uh, a, a distinction in terms of we can, when people qualify and when they move on to become a fellow, they can call themselves a chartered ship broker, which is again a, a distinct professional recognition which only the Institute of Chartered Ship Brokers has and it's it's a globally recognized qualification so it is a qualification that you can travel in the same way as you're a chartered accountant or a chartered surveyor it does provide you with that uh credible peer recognition recognition and it, it is a a very recognized and reputable organization in terms of the the education side of what we do so we started out as a membership organization 110 years ago and, and over time we have set professional standards and we set those professional standards through qualification, through education. And we've got a number of different modules uh, that students can take. And there's degrees of specialization. So if you're coming from a tanker background, there's tanker chartering that you can go into. And then they've got all the fundamental elements of um, part-time law, uh, economics and transport, so there's economic and trade. So there's there's lots of um, choice for people to find areas of specialization, particularly their employers where they're looking at uh, having a... Uh, an employee who's going to add more value to their operation, uh, having someone that's professionally qualified, I think, brings a lot to to uh, to a business. That's real. That's really cool. Yeah, the closest thing I, I know, um, Asba offered a class that was I, I, similar, I would imagine, or at least there were parts of it that was similar. I took that part of my my uh, undergraduate degree at uh, at SUNY Maritime. Uh, as we talk about digital, have you guys has the institute? addressed the digitization of the industry is that something that you guys can talk about when when your students go through qualifications it is i mean we're we're, we're very much focused now on uh, on moving into improving our our digital outlook improving our digital strategy uh the the world is changing uh the world changed covid changed a lot in terms of online capability mm-hmm. online delivery of education uh, even online exams, and uh, we're dealing now with a, a a student base. Particularly, our student base will be millennials, typically people twenty to thirty five, and they're more tech savvy, and they expect a lot more in terms of their their choices. I mean, there's a uh, famous Harvard uh, professor uh, Clayton Christensen. And he he talked about jobs to be done, and we see that when people have a, a particular job in mind when they're students, they're looking for they're going to do their market research on who's the most tech savvy, what uh, digital capability these organizations have to provide me with rich content through my learning experience. And we're very aware of that. And we're now moving more towards, we now have online lectures. We can, you can do part of your PQEs online or the online shipping Academy, the Institute's online shipping Academy provides that. Um, but we also have still have the face to face lectures in twenty seven branches in some of those branches around the around the world you can still do that 
but we're moving towards digital books. We're now assess assessing the feasibility of online exams. We host exams in over 100 centers around the world. So how feasible, how efficient that is, we have to look at. But certainly we've got to listen to what students want uh, into the future. And they, they, pref they prefer, uh, I think, a greater digital experience. So we have to keep up with that. And we're now in a transformative element of uh, investing more over the, in, into the long term. But certainly now it's a, it's a, we have a digital innovation working group, which was set up in the last 12 months purely to address this. So it is a, it's a very big part of our thinking going forward. And it will be something that's going to be trans transformative in terms of what the future in Institute looks like. So speaking of the future, I think that's a great segue. Uh, if you have somebody maybe coming out of university, maybe not necessarily with a shipping background, you know, I, I my family is really not, I think I've told this story before I went to a uh, career fair at my high school and SUNY Maritime was there. And my dad who grew up in the Bronx uh, was like, Oh, I thought that was like a coast guard station. I had no idea what it was. He grew up literally about 10 kilometers, 15 kilometers away. So we went to visit my grandmother, went to the school and I'm like, I'm in. Uh, and so, you know, not, you know, someone like me, a few years ago, uh, that person now coming out or coming out of a university, maybe not necessarily a maritime university, but just generally, what, what, why should you should they be encouraged to come into our industry? I think if you if it's great, I mean, we're both, you know, we're sort of preaching to the converted. You and I, I mean, we we we're typically advocates of the the shipping quicksand that the deeper you 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 get into it, the more you struggle. You know, the deeper you go into, you can't get out of it. Um, and that's always a caveat. You give people a warning. Once you come into this business, it is infections. It's a, it's a fantastic. It's business. like the God. It's like the God. That scene from The Godfather. Just when you, just when I thought I was getting, you know, just when I thought I was out, they suck you back in. It's the same thing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. There, there's no way out. But if you're someone that has worldly interest, if you're interested in geography, people, cultures, trades, commodities, I mean, that this is our job day to day. Uh, if you have someone that has a general appreciation or understanding of how the global economy works, you will fit in uh, because they're the talking points that you'll regularly be discussing with your with your clients, with your with your peers. So uh, I think people that have those type of interests excel and do really well in this business. Ship broking, there's lots of elements. You know, we can you can work as an analyst, you can work as an operator, you can be a broker. There's a, a skill set there for everybody for as a research. There's, there's so many different facets to the business, but. I think the, the it is a hard business. We know that, particularly when you come in the entry level, they make it hard. Uh, there is no nine to five that goes with this job. It doesn't sit there. You need to be prepared to, to work hard and the rewards come, but they can take a long time for those rewards to come. But generally, uh, the people that aren't able to survive in this business, they generally don't last. I mean, it is a business that will quickly let you know whether you're cut out for or not. The people around you, your employers can generally give you a gentle persuasion whether you're good enough or not. Uh, and I think that those skills are sort of, we, we can identify the people, as Liam Neeson says, that has those particular set of skills. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, there's, they, we, we, we can see that and we know the people that will be able to go. And I could see it myself as a trainee, people that are around me that didn't last. I've seen people that I've tried to train that, that, that weren't cut out for it and it's a gentle it's a generally a gentle release most people know when it's not cut, cut out for them and the worst thing you can do is prolong it but it's a fantastic career it's a career that will take you around the world you'll meet it, lots and lots of interesting people and as i said if you work hard the re rewards are there for people that generally generally work hard but not guaranteed i can't guarantee that oh, but no, it's, it, it's certainly it, a profession yeah. to be in no, it's definitely not guaranteed, but you go back to the point of of, of traveling. I, I remember er, kind of early, I, I got into brokerage a little bit on the late side uh, because I did, you know, I sailed and I did some stuff at uh, at um, ExxonMobil and other things. And what, what four or five years into, I don't know, two, three years into broking, uh, at the time they had the, um, it was right after Posidonia, they would do the Parisian ship broking parties. And I remember my boss like, oh, you need to go to this. You talk to the couple of, the Paris ship brokers, you should go. And I was like, people are like, well, here at home, we're like, well, why are you going to Paris for parties? <laughs> you know, it's like, wait, wait, you, clients. Oh yeah, they'll be there. But really it's, there's two or three big parties and we're, you know, basically you land and you meet somebody at a wine bar. 
and there you go off to the races and it's uh, you know you look at that and you go that's that's pretty cool right that's that was yes i didn't get to go to plaza doni I've, I've been twice subsequently but you know um but it's certainly it's great and and you know very likely at the uh, end of the year uh, i'll be going to hamburg that'll be the first time for ice Bind, which is a big a big to do there and again what are you doing it why are you going to hamburg for a party I, you know and, and here i am saying that 20 years later it's pretty it's a pretty dynamic part plus a lot of the things that you say it attracted me to the industry um this was a great conversation i love to ask kind of an interesting question i've changed my question a little bit uh here so i used to ask about books but uh, i'm going to change a little bit who is your hero of fiction it could be any sort of fiction it could be written it could be movies it could be what have you glenn if you had to relate to had somebody that's a hero of yours who, who would you say i think that's probably the hardest question you've asked me today actually most of the stuff that i can i'm comfortable in because it's it's my space and i can exist in it um yeah in terms of fiction i'm i'm not big with, with fiction if i'm honest i'm not big with uh superheroes or, or stuff like that my, my kids certainly when they were growing up i would have been surrounded by it. maybe that's why i i don't like it as much but um if i to pick somebody someone that sort of spanned generations from the time when i was a child through to modern times even though i wouldn't say he's a hero but he's a hero in in the sense of what he does it, it would be maybe somebody like james bond um oh, perfect sort of, yeah that's yeah, perfect who, who travels yeah. generations yeah yeah, yeah so that's... It, and I, I think the Daniel Craig was 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 certainly the best from what I've seen. I think he's he leaves um, huge shoes to fill. But I remember when he came into the role, people said the same thing. Oh, I don't think he's going to be James Bond, but to me, he he's fantastic. But I loved everything about that character and uh, what what he does, and whether you know ethically all the decisions that he makes are right or not. But in, in this modern world, he he's always seemed to be the hero. And uh, I think as a franchise and as a brand and taking uh, Ian Fleming's books, uh, to be able to continue to reinvent that for so many generations and keep it relevant, there's relevant. a message in there for us all. And particularly for what we do as as brokers, the, the art of um, reinvention, they, they've done it so well. And they love their gadgets and brokers love their gadgets. Oh, go your bro- bro- cars and, and their fancy phones. So, I mean, there must be something in there. I, re- I, I You know, I, I wasn't with QED. When we rolled out a position list for brokers, uh, they rolled out a, an app at the same time and they did this goofy video. I shouldn't say goofy, uh, maybe I edit that, but they did this video that, that like it was ship brokers hanging out at a pub and they're sending a list from the, from the thing. And, you know, you talk about toys and everything, but I have to agree with James Bond. Um, you know, I, I look at James Bond in a similar light as I look at, at star Wars content in the sense of, you know, it may, everything may not be for everybody. You know, I, somebody may prefer, you know, Sean Connery and, and there was even those who prefer uh, Roger Moore because it was kind of, he was a little more kind of less serious and more goofy, you know, especially with some of his things. And I, I, you know, all that stuff and, and Pierce Bronson and, and who knows what the new one will be. Uh, I've seen, maybe it's a woman, maybe it's, is somebody else who, who knows it's good but but i think you're right it's going to be reinvented and people aren't going to be happy but then when you're going to look at the body of work 10 years from now you may say well that was uh that was the obvious choice that was that was a very good one and I, and I think that's a really great parallel and a great way to wrap things up to say that brokers like the james bond uh uh novel and where i was going with star wars was people aren't always happy but you know you just got to sometimes do it. And, and certainly like with James Bond and everything uh, you got to reinvent yourself and you got to use the technology that's there uh, to, to stay ahead of the, to stay ahead of the curve. So, so Glenn, th- this was fantastic. Thank you for coming on the podcast. I, I really do appreciate it. Uh, and thank you for supporting it by listening. We talked about that before. So I, I, I do appreciate uh, everything there. Chris, thanks a million. And I really pre- appreciate you giving me the time today and uh, more so, what you're doing keep doing it it's fantastic you provide a, a really great platform for lots of people in our industry uh, to to be able to talk and communicate and, and talk about interesting and topical things that we're doing and we need more of that and uh, you know you, you're flying the flag for us so uh, congratulations what you do and uh, again thanks for your time i, I really appreciate it. it's been fun uh, th- thank you for the kind words glenn thank you